Can you believe school is back already? I know, right? The year is going by so fast. And this year, I'm going to help the schools in my neighborhood by donating through Donors Choose. That's an amazing idea. Donors Choose is the most trusted nonprofit that connects teachers and kids to donors who believe in them. And their site is so easy to use. Searching for a local school on their map and finding match offers to boost my donation is a breeze. Visit DonorsChoose.org slash local and give today. I was forgotten and you reached out to me. As Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you do unto me. Support a child in his name through Compassion International at Compassion.com slash unto me. It's time to have your high five moment with High Five Casino, the top social casino where the action and real prizes never stop. Fun spins and big wins are right at your fingertips with over a thousand games, including High Five Casino exclusives. High Five Casino is always free to play with free coins given out every four hours. Sign up today and get free welcome coins you can spin for a chance at cash prizes. Visit HighFiveCasino.com. High Five Casino. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to our Paranormal Afterlife. This is our Paranormal Afterlife, and I'm your host, Simon Bowne. This week, I'm talking to Dr. Melvin Morse and AJ Parr about children's near-death experiences. Dr. Melvin Morse was an Associate Professor of Paediatrics at the University of Washington for 20 years, he has published numerous books, peer-reviewed articles, and won awards for his research on spiritual healing, remote viewing, and other aspects of human consciousness. AJ Parr is an internationally recognized journalist, best-selling author, and senior research associate at the Institute for Scientific Study of Consciousness. He has authored over 20 books on comparative religion and spirituality. And you can enjoy the extended version of this episode at free along with over a hundred hours of extended episodes on Patreon. Hi, AJ and Melvin. Thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. Of course. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you for inviting us. We're going to be talking about children's near-death experiences. And I wanted to ask you, Dr. Morse, can you tell us about the 15-year study you did with children's near-death experiences? Absolutely. Um, I, I'd like to introduce myself first. Um, I'm a critical for a former care physician. So, you know, I spent uh, most of my career resuscitating critically ill children. And most of them do not survive, uh, unlike what you see on TV. Uh, it turns out that if your heart stops beating, uh, that's a very, a fairly serious event. And uh, to, to actually recover from that is unusual. And I, I, I had a, you know, normal medical training. I trained at Johns Hopkins and we were taught that when you die, you die. You know, that the brain creates consciousness. Uh, granted, in some unspecified way, granted there's been no uh, scientific evidence or proof or, or even, even uh, respectable theory of how the brain could generate consciousness, but that was my training. And uh, till I resuscitated a young girl in uh, Pocatello, Idaho. And uh, she had nearly drowned in the community swimming pool. Uh, she was documented as being underwater uh, for at least 20 minutes. So her uh, resuscitation and full recovery to health was uh, truly remarkable. And, you know, the, all these things, they seem to start off with a coincidence. <laughs> My mom, who had a near-death experience, would always uh, tell me, there's no coincidences. But uh, anyway, the reason that this journey started for me was a coincidence. I just happened to be working uh, in a clinic in uh, Pocatello, Idaho, uh, just really sort of filling in for the other doctors. And I happened to see her uh, after she had been discharged from the uh, hospital uh, in, uh, Idaho, in uh, Utah. She had been sent back to this clinic for follow-up. And I saw her in the hallway. I said, oh, hi, Crystal. Boy, you know, I bet you don't remember me, uh, but I sure remember you. And I'm so glad to see you're doing so well. And she turns to her mother and she says to her mother, oh, no, I remember him. 
He's the one that put a tube in my nose. And that really struck me uh, because uh, my training had been a, a little unusual. And I did intubate patients by putting tubes in their noses. Uh, uh, whereas, you know, uh, I would say 95% of doctors uh, intubate by putting a tube in the mouth. And that's what she would have seen, you know, from TV or uh, or whatever. And yet she looked at me and she said, I saw you put a tube in my nose. And I didn't like that. And she went on to uh, give a full blow-by-blow -blow description of her resuscitation. She told me put me in a big machine that looked like a donut, which was her description of a CAT skin. Uh, she described accurately conversations I had uh, with the nurses and uh, with uh, doctors at Seattle Children's Hospital. And this was a time where I knew she was clinically dead. Uh, her pupils, you know, her eyes uh, were fixed and dilated. Uh, she had almost no uh, reflexes associated uh, with survival. She had what we call a Glasgow coma score of less than three, which a very few children survive uh, such a severe event. Uh, so uh, I knew she was uh, clinically dead. Uh, there was no way she was having some kind of, you know, some uh, way of, of knowing all this that went on around her. And then she saw the look on my face. I was, I was like, oh my God, you know, what is this about? And she pats me on the wrist and she said, you see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun. And that was the first I'd ever heard of a near-death experience. And it was obvious to me uh, that she had had some sort of real event at the point of death. I then uh, took that information uh, when I returned to Seattle Children's Hospital. And as you indicated, we began a 15-year study of uh, near-death experiences in children so we could find out whether what happened to her was you know, some sort of one-off fascinoma or whether this was, in fact, a real experience that happened to children uh, you know, when they die, and, you know, and meaning that it'll happen to us all when we die. How did you find the children for the study? Uh, with, uh, you know, I always hear Simon, people saying, oh, you know, medical science doesn't uh, uh, support this sort of thing, or this isn't scientific, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, actually, uh, I worked with the head of the intensive care unit at Seattle Children's Hospital. And the head of the Department of Psychiatry and the head of the Department of Neurology. Uh, so we were the medical mainstream. And we uh, wanted to answer the question is, does this experience happen at the point of death? Or is this experience simply uh, the result of being uh, seriously ill and the psychological stresses? Uh, that that might trigger, or is it caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain, or the various uh, medications that we give uh, during resuscitation? And so we thought to ourselves, you know, actually we had thought this was probably uh, due to medications given at the point of resuscitation. So we chose our patients based on how seriously ill they were. Essentially, interviewed every survivor of cardiac arrest or severe coma at Seattle Children's Hospital over a 15-year period of time. We chose the patients in advance. We did not take volunteers to our study. Uh, we didn't have people apply to the study. But instead, we identified who we wanted to study. Basically, children who'd survive cardiac arrest, as Crystal Merzlock uh, had. And we carefully compared them to control patients, uh, meaning patients who were the same age, same sex, treated with the same drugs, had the same lack of oxygen, but were not near death, according to our criteria uh, for our study. We even titled our study deliberately in a way to uh, not tip our hand. Uh, we titled our study. Uh, an investigation 
into the psychological uh, components of surviving the pediatric intensive care unit. Because we didn't want anybody to know that we were interested in near-death experiences or spiritual experiences or anything like that. And then we very systematically asked the patients, uh, well, the parents of the patients, if they would participate in our study. And uh, basically, uh, we had, you know, all the survivors of cardiac arrest. We only had one or two patients uh, that declined to be part of our study. Um, total of 26 patients over a 15-year period who we identified as truly being at the point of death. And then we systematically interviewed them. And we simply asked them, what do you remember about being in the scary intensive care unit? And we, so we didn't tell you to say, did you see heaven or did you see God? Uh, we didn't have any leading questions like that. In fact, our human subject review board, our uh, uh, committee uh, that guided us uh, in our study, uh, they, uh, we had to submit the questions in advance, you know, what we were going to actually ask the children. And those are the types of questions we ask. You know, what do you remember about being in the intensive care unit? Uh, what do you think happens to us when we die? What have your parents taught you uh, about uh, life after death? Uh, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, very uh, bland questions. And we asked the same questions of our control patients, uh, you know, to make sure uh, that we weren't uh, in any way uh, prejudicing our study. And we found to our great surprise that of our 20 patients, 24 of them had vivid memories of surviving clinical death. And they refer those memories to the moment of death. And I would say only one or two of these children had uh, even uh, discussed their experiences before our study. Uh, so they hadn't even talked about uh, these experiences uh, with their parents. I asked one little girl, I said to her, I said, so wh why didn't you tell anybody? Because <laughs> uh, she was very upset about her experience. Uh, she had to see a psychiatrist for years for behavior problems. And uh, said, why, why didn't you even tell the psychiatrist that you had this experience? And she said, well, I didn't think you were supposed to be able to talk to God. <laughs> so even she knew, you know, at age six, that in our society, uh, you know, people who actually talk to God are considered to be crazy. You know, we, 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 of course, want people to believe in God and have faith in God, and we want them to go to church. Uh, but, but people who say, oh, yeah, I talked to God yesterday, uh, well, we, we, uh, our instinct is uh, that they must be crazy. And these children knew that, too. And that's why, by and large, uh, they did not want to discuss their experiences. And also there's that idea that, they might have been having these experiences because of a lack of oxygen. But then you ask, well, if it's down to a lack of oxygen, why doesn't everybody have an experience when the oxygen is low? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, there's been a lot of study, uh, studies of uh, what happens to uh, the brain uh, when you have a lot, lack of oxygen. Uh, and uh, Navy divers... Uh, you know, United States uh, military, uh, et cetera, has done a lot of studies, uh, the rapture of the deeps, uh, that sort of thing. And they don't describe near-death experiences. Uh, they do describe uh, vivid hallucinations and such as that. But as we're going to see, the near-death experience has nothing in common with other uh, hallucinations. But to uh, finish answering your question directly, so for every uh, patient that we had, we had at least four control patients because we had such a small number of patients. We only had 26. So we wanted to have hundreds of control patients. So we interviewed hundreds of children who had a profound lack of oxygen to their brain, but were not near death given the criteria of our study. And our study was uh, that they had a 90% chance of dying. Uh, you know, they only had a five to ten percent chance of surviving uh, clinical. And so 
the children that we interviewed that had a lot of oxygen to their brain, they fit time yeah. with the conventional neurology that I've been taught. They didn't remember anything. So, uh, you know, conventional neurology teaches us uh, that when you have a severe traumatic event, it's going to cause a lack of oxygen to the brain. It's going to, uh, your heart is going to stop beating, uh, or uh, it's you're sick enough to be in an intensive care unit. By and large, you wipe out all of your short term memory. And so the typical child or control child would be, well, I don't really remember being in the hospital. That, you know, they would say, I remember being really sick and I remember uh, coming home. I remember waking up with my parents there. Uh, but by and large, they have no memories of uh, being uh, uh, so severely ill, which fits with uh, what uh, conventional neurology teaches us. I was unskilled, and you trained me. I was forgotten, and you reached out to me. I was fatherless, and you nurtured me. I was broken, and you mended me. As Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you do unto me. Support a child in his name through Compassion International at Compassion.com slash unto me. It's time to have your high five moment with High Five Casino, the top social casino where the action and real prizes never stop. Fun spins and big wins are right at your fingertips with over a thousand games, including High Five Casino exclusives. High Five Casino is always free to play with free coins given out every four hours. Sign up today and get free welcome coins you can spin for a chance at cash prizes. Visit HighFiveCasino.com. High Five Casino. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply. To our great surprise, Simon, we discovered that the children who were at the point of clinical death also had no memories of the conventional memories of being uh, in the hospital setting. So, for example, uh, one young girl, uh, I had to put a needle in her heart uh, to restart it. Uh, she prevent, uh, presented in severe cardiac arrest uh, with an infection of her heart. So that's near death by any criteria. She had no memories of being at home. She had no memories of the ambulance picking her up and bringing her to the hospital. She had no memory of being in the hospital, and she had no memories of being discharged, which fits with what we're taught should be, you know, that's her short-term memory is wiped out. Instead, she had one distinct memory. And that memory, she references to the point of being clinically dead. And how do I, because she said to me, she said, I heard you asking the nurses for that crash cart thingy. So she references only memory uh, at the point of being near death. And she said that she saw her grandmother. And I said, your grandmother? And she said, oh, yeah, I was just so shocked to see her. Uh, her grandmother had already uh, passed. And uh, I said, oh, okay, well, tell me what that was like. And she said, well, uh, I was just suddenly somewhere, and I saw my grandmother. And she was smiling at me and letting me know everything was all right. And then this little girl says, and then I was back. And I said to her, what do you mean you were back? And she clenches her fists. And she looks at me and she goes, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> so she only had this one single memory. And so what this teaches us, because, you know, her findings are replicated by the other uh, children, is that at the point of death, we regain consciousness. In contrast to what I was taught at Johns Hopkins, and I trained under the gods of uh of neurology and uh, neurosurgery, uh, you know, some of the greatest, uh, Dr. Muncastle, uh, who uh, I mean, is, you know, well known to be one of the giants of neurology and neurosurgery. So I knew what the conventional training was. And this uh, little girl defied that because at the point of death, she regained consciousness. 
And she had an expanded sense of consciousness. She had an awareness that extended beyond her physical body. And she interacted with people uh, who she would have no ordinary way of interacting with, uh, mean, meaning her grandmother. Um, so uh, we could just dismiss this as hallucination. That's why we took the trouble to carefully compare her experience to other children exactly like her, just as sick, but not at the point of death, treated with the same medicines, same lack of oxygen to the brain. Those children had no memories. The other children, sure enough, they would say, and always referring it to the point of death. One little, well, one child said to me after we resuscitated him, he looked up at me and he said, that was weird. You guys just sucked me back into my body. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, that's obviously he's referencing his experience to the point of uh, near death. Uh, another uh, child said to me, forget my body. Forget being alive. All I wanted to do was to get to that light, which was a light that she, uh, he saw uh, in the context of nearly dying. There, there really can be no doubt that this experience is the dying experience. And Simon, before I, uh, I, I know you have uh, tons of questions, but I want to quickly let your heat listeners know that our study was replicated in a large study of adults in the Netherlands. They found the exact same results that we did. And there is an experimental study of the processes of dying done by the United States Warfare Institute in which they took pilots and they whirled them in centrifuges to the point of near death. And the pilots had the same sequence of events that my children had. They were unconscious. Uh, they often had seizures. Uh, and yet, at the point of near death, when in theory, their blood flow to their brain was going to stop, those pilots, fighter pilots, regained consciousness and had the experience of leaving their physical body and entering into a spiritual reality. Uh, why did they do those tests? Uh, those are tests uh, to see uh, what G-forces fighter pilots can tolerate uh, because they don't want to design uh, airplanes that can go too fast uh, for pilots to be able to fly them. Uh, so that's why they uh, did these studies. And yet these studies uh, definitely show that at the point of death, human beings regain consciousness. As soon as our brain gets out of the way, we then regain consciousness and interact with a greater consciousness uh, that's beyond our physical body. Uh, sure, I, I know that doesn't sound very scientific. It wasn't the science I was taught. And yet the essence of science is to follow your observations. And these are clearly experimental observations that must be explained by science. Well, I'd like to ask both of you, is there things that you can learn from children's near-death experiences that you can't learn from adults' near-death experiences? Is there certain things that children observe or, or come to them that it seems like if an adult said it, you might say, well, they've been exposed to the media and they, they know all about near-death experiences, but children haven't been exposed to that stuff? Uh, absolutely. And uh, that's definitely what we found uh, with the children that we uh, interviewed. One thing, uh, one reason that I'm on your show, Simon, and on shows like this, is I feel so blessed to have been able to interview these children for the very first time. Because uh, in uh, you know uh, harmony with what you're saying, when these children describe their experience for the first time, uh, after that, that, you know, they describe something that they don't fully understand. For example, uh, one young man, uh, uh, he was uh, underwater for 45 minutes. Uh, his, uh, his parents, ski instructors, they were driving home uh, from the ski slopes one uh, evening. Their car flipped over a guardrail and plunged into a river. Uh, uh, they were about 20 feet uh, underwater. He was under there for about 45 minutes. And uh, in the uh, world of in 
intensive care unit medicine, uh, we know that you're not dead until you're warm and dead, uh, which is uh, why that young man survived. And I asked him about his experience, and he looked at me, and he said, I was in a huge noodle, and I went through the big noodle till I got to heaven. And then he looks at me with this look in his eyes, and he goes, wait a minute, it couldn't have been a noodle. It must have been a tunnel, because noodles don't have rainbows in them. <laughs> So, you know, that's, you know, and hearing it for the first time, you know, after that, he always would say that he was in the tunnel. Um, you know, he, he, but that very first time he described something, uh, you know, that obviously he was struggling to understand. And you're absolutely right. These children, regardless of, you know, what they've been taught, uh, for example, the first child that uh, I was telling about, Crystal Merslock. She came from an intensely religious Mormon family, and yet there's no Mormon imagery in her near-death experience. Uh, she described crawling up a brick-lined tunnel to a place she thought was heaven. Uh, you know, there's no brick-lined tunnels uh, in the Book of Mormon. Um, and I took the trouble uh, to ask her parents, well, what did you teach her about life after death? And they said, well, we taught her that the... Uh, body is a glove and that when you die the glove comes off of the hand and is the soul and it still survives so there's none of that imagery uh, in her experience uh, at all in fact some of the children uh, discussed reincarnation even though they came from conventional uh, lutheran uh, backgrounds uh, one little girl told me that she saw a door where grandpa's and grandmas and babies were waiting to be born. And that, of course, is no part of uh, you know, her religious upbringing. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The children's experiences, they're very simple, and they're very pure. And uh, they go right to the heart of the matter, uh, you know, without any embellishment. If anything, they usually are fragments. They, they don't really tell a coherent story. They just tell these sort of fragments. And the fragments, interestingly enough, often change in the direction of conventional, uh, you know, uh, understandings of religion. Uh, for example, uh, one young man uh, that I interviewed, uh, he was uh, he almost died because he dug a hole on the beach, and then the sand collapsed, uh, and he was trapped uh, in this sort of a you know, a beach uh, tunnel that he had uh, dug for himself. And he told me that uh, uh, he uh, uh, floated out of his body and that he sort of followed the ambulance uh, to the hospital, uh, sort of like he was a balloon uh, attached to his body. And then he told me that a wizard came to him, a wizard who was dressed in white and told him, struggle and you shall live. Well, this uh, little boy was uh, preoccupied with Dungeons and Dragons and uh, video games. And this uh, uh, symbolism of the wizard was something uh, that uh, was very much consistent with what, you know, uh, games he played, you know, etc. And so I was very interested when I interviewed him three months later. Uh, he told me that it wasn't a wizard at all. Parents had informed him that it was Jesus Christ. Uh, but nevertheless, regardless of what label we put on it, uh, it's something that came to him at the point of death that was dressed in white, that was powerful, that urged him to struggle and to live. And then, of course, we're going to put our labels on these events. Uh, they, they're outside of our ordinary uh, understandings. Uh, you know, we don't have any uh, uh, a way of... Uh, you know, deciding, uh, you know, like like everything else we do, even the color red, remember, we sit around saying, you know, that's red, that's red, that's red, till we all mutually decide that a certain wavelength of light can be described as red. Well, when to these spiritual experiences at death, uh, of course, we interpret them, uh, you know, according to our own uh, um, preconceptions. And children have far fewer preconceptions uh, than adults 
And that's why I got these very simple, pure experiences from them. Hello, this is me, Simon. Did you know that during a past life regression, you can meet with your spirit guide? I conduct past life regression sessions over Zoom, and I've guided many clients to a spiritual encounter with their guide. If you would like to ask me how a session would work for you, you can book a free 20-minute consultation on my website, pastlifeshypnosis.co.uk. The link is in the show notes. And AJ, do you have a viewpoint on this, of what we can learn from children's experiences that we can't learn from adults? Oh, yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I admire Dr. Melvin Moores. I first read about him in the book The Light Beyond by Dr. Uh, Raymond Moody. He mentioned that uh, Dr. Morse was the first scientist to study children's near-death experiences. So I was really interested in meeting him. I managed to contact him, and since then... Uh, we actually became friends and collaborator, collaborators. AJ, AJ, you've written books on children's near-death experiences. You've interviewed dozens of children that have these experiences. Tell the listeners what you've learned. Very few people have actually interviewed children who've had experiences. So tell yes. the listeners what you've learned from all of your experience working with children, which is extensive. Well, yes. Basically, children uh, under the age of five or five or, or under, they, prob they basically have no background. They have not had time to be programmed or to be socially educated on subjects like death or religion or spirituality. However, I interviewed uh, one uh, female who at the age of two had a near-death experience and she remembered it clearly. And she had the same uh, commonalities. She, she experienced the same commonalities that you usually find in adults. That is meeting the, meeting the light, uh, merging with the light, uh, seeing uh, light beings, and uh, a whole other uh, collection of elements that we are commonly found in uh, adult patients or adult near-death experiencers. There was another uh, guy who, at the age of three, had a life review. And this is really uh, interesting because uh, you, you may ask yourself, how can someone at the age of three have a life review? Well, he said... He, he did not only remember his uh, short life, but he also remembered his past life when he took his life and it was explained to him that he had been reincarnated to accomplish the, uh, the goals that he had set uh, in, in his previous life. So this was really shocking, uh, learning these things. I also interviewed several of them who were uh, five years old and. Uh, one of them met, saw Jesus Christ, or what they believed to be Jesus Christ, just like uh, Dr. Morse mentioned uh, about this guy, this this kid who saw the, the wizard, and then his parents told him uh, that it was Jesus Christ. Most of these uh, people, including adults, when they see uh, a light being full of love that emanates light, that, that is a uh, wise and that it seems like he is the incarnation of God, they may call him Jesus if you are if they were brought up in, in a Christian society. But people from other societies, it has been proven that they call it, they give it different names. Some people call him Krishna. Some people call him uh, uh, with other names, you know. They even talk about Buddha. Um, some people even talk about Mohammed. So, uh, it all depends on your cultural cultural upbringing. So, but these kids who are five years old or or less, they have no background. They have no education. So, how can this be? How is it possible that they have that they experience the same common elements? 
So that was really a, that's what that's the 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 fact that most impacted me, and um, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Melvin Morse is also aware of that because we've talked about it uh, many times. One of the things that uh, Dr. Morse found out with the Seattle study is that most of most of these kids who have a a, a near death uh, event they do have. Uh, and what they call an NDE, a near-death experience, more than adults. Um, a, a high percentage of children who undergo cardiac arrest have a near-death experience. And these kids, uh, like I said, they have the same common elements. Another uh, researcher that I interviewed was PMH Atwater. She uh, was really impressed by Dr. Morse's uh, studies and decided to conduct a series of studies on her own. Also, Pim Van, Dr. Pim Van Lommel, he replicated the Seattle study in a group of adults and found the same uh, the same commonalities. And there have been uh, a limited number of uh, researchers that have spent years, even decades, studying children, and they have they all have confirmed. The findings that uh, that Dr. Morse uh, uh, found in his uh, Seattle study. I had the chance to interview um, Crystal Merslock, who was that seven-year-old girl who drowned, the first NDE patient that uh, Dr. Morse uh, treated, and uh, this was 40 years after the events. Where this year is the 40th anniversary of her drowning. So um, she confirmed everything that uh, Dr. Moore said, but she also told me something else. She told me that Dr. Morse did not believe her. She that Dr. Morse was out to get her. She was. She said that <laughs> doc, he was a skeptic and that he he really did not believe in near death experiences, and that somehow she, he was transformed. Is that true? Uh, Is that true, uh, Dr. Morse? Well, that's because we're scientists, though, AJ. We're at the end of the day, the training that I got at Johns Hopkins did serve me well because we were scientists. It's true that we structured our study uh, to uh, show that perhaps these experiences are caused by medications or a lack of oxygen to the brain, because, of course, that's what the current uh, scientific theories. Uh, would suggest. And I think I shared with you before that uh, she knew I was skeptical. <laughs> I, I couldn't control my face uh, when she told me these uh, this story, uh, particularly the part about being in heaven and meeting the heavenly father. And, you know, I just was practically rolling my eyes at that point. And that's when she patted me on the wrist and said, oh, you'll see, Dr. Heaven is fun. But we structured our study in such a way that we were ready to accept any of the results that we, uh, which, which is, uh, you know, as uh, the same thing with our mediumship study. You know, we structured mediumship study in such a way that any result we would be able to report in the scientific literature. And sure enough, in our Seattle study of children, 24 out of 26 children had some sort of near-death experience. That is not the result that they see in adults. Uh, Pin Van Lummel, uh, who replicated our study in a much larger study of adults, uh, showed about uh, 17% of the patients uh, had near-death experiences. And I believe that this is because of cultural conditioning. I think that these children are so simple and so pure that they simply report whatever it is that they experienced, you know, that they uh, thought happened to them. You know, like the little boy that said, oh, yeah, I was in a huge middle, you know, or, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, or when one boy said, I've, I've been uh, climbing to heaven, uh, you know, as part of uh, uh, when we asked him, what do you remember of out being in the intensive care unit. Adults, they already know that these experiences are going to be dismissed 
that they're going to be ridiculed uh, uh, for them. Um, and uh, so adults are much more likely to suppress the experience uh, that, uh, or they're much more likely uh, to not want to talk about the experience uh, than uh, children in their simplicity uh, are often uh, more willing to report exactly what they So do you think that um, Pim Van Lommel's uh, 17% would actually have got a higher percentage if all of the adults were completely honest and some of them just said, no, I didn't have an experience, but really they did. I think it's more complicated than that. I think that people uh, suppress the experience. Uh, I don't know this as a result. You know, uh, there's no scientific study that I can point to. Uh, it's just my general impression uh, over the many years, uh, because I often meet uh, adults. And they will very indignantly tell me, they'll say something like, you know, uh, I nearly died and nothing like that happened to me. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, there was no tunnel, there was no light. Uh, she did. Uh, you know, no relatives came to me. And yet then I'll spend a little bit of time talking to them. And it's remarkable what they'll suddenly uh, come up with. Uh, uh, one that comes to mind was I was on a radio show once and the uh, interviewer was telling me uh, that he nearly died in a car accident. And uh, he had been in the back seat of the car and uh, had been uh, lying down. And he told me that suddenly he realized that the car uh, had uh, plummeted off uh, you know, a, a cliff and uh, was going to crash at the bottom. He was going to die. And he reported telling me that he could see uh, what was on the dashboard of the car. And I said to him, well, that doesn't make sense because you just told me that you were in, in the back seat, uh, lying down. And by this point, you would have been unconscious. And he gets this weird look on his face and he said, you know, that's right. He said, I, I can't really... The, it seemed like I could see everything, but you're right. It doesn't make any sense. How could I have seen anything? And then right then he remembered his near death experience. It was so powerful uh, that uh, they had to go to commercial. <laughs> he was uh, because, uh, you know, he was uh, so uh, taken by it. And that's not the only time that that's happened to me. You know, hearing these experiences over the years uh, really gives me the idea that the uh, Adults, uh, I don't think they're consciously suppressing it. I think they're unconsciously uh, suppressing it. That it just it, it doesn't fit. Yeah, I, believe, I agree. Uh, should I, agree. I, I recently interviewed uh, this woman who had uh, recovered the memory of her near death experience nineteen years after having that experience, and this is yeah. something that I have found that is rather common. People forget completely, can, may, some people completely forget their experience. And years later, all of a sudden, they remember it. I wanted to ask you about verifiable near-death experiences, that kind of thing that Crystal Merslock had, where she could tell you about events when you know she was clinically dead. So if people can relate these events and they're verified, what does that tell us about the rest of the experience when they go through the tunnel and they meet deceased loved ones and other spiritual beings? Oh, there's sure. a story that Dr. Melvin had told me once uh, about this boy who died and was told that he was going to have a little brother. Why don't you tell it, Dr. Melvin? Sure. Um, you know, one of my uh, patients as part of uh, her near death uh, was told uh, that she had to uh, go back to help her mother. Um, and uh, she uh, drew me a picture. And in the picture, uh, you know, she's sort of, she's in heaven in this picture. And then she's sort of looking down, uh, you know, at, at uh, her home. And she draws a little picture uh, of her mother uh, with a baby inside of her. And then she drew a gigantic heart in the chest uh, of this uh, baby. And uh, sure enough, um, well, the parents uh, at the time of the child's near-death experience uh, didn't know whether it was a 
boy or a girl, uh, and the uh, child was born uh, with severe uh, cardiac uh, enlargement. Uh, so the uh, girl's experience uh, was absolutely correct. But uh, there's, there's no shortage, Simon, of these types of details in near-death experiences. Uh, the children that we interviewed, they, they seem to get it right. Uh, one uh, boy told me, he said that uh, as he rose out of his body, um, and he drew me a picture of this, uh, he could look down at uh, the hospital rooms, and then uh, he drew the waiting room, and he drew his mother holding his grandfather. And uh, he had no way of knowing that his grandfather had uh, come from out of town uh, to be at the at his bedside. Um, you know, he 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 didn't know that. Uh, you know, nobody, uh, you know, would have told him that. Uh, you know, he was a severe drowning victim. Uh, so, uh, for uh, you know anybody to have uh, told him that uh, uh, your grandfather's going to be traveling from out of town to uh, come see you. Uh, when you're in the hospital, um, and yet uh, he accurately described it. There, there's no end to these uh, experiences. Unsolved mysteries. Unsolved mysteries has done three episodes of my patients at Seattle Children's Hospital, carefully documenting everything. So, Simon, why aren't these uh, these veridical experiences convincing? Why doesn't it change anybody's mind? Um, and I think it's because right now we don't have a scientific framework with which to understand near-death experiences. And it's not that we don't have a scientific framework. It's that we don't understand the scientific framework that we do have. It turns out modern science does support the idea of consciousness body uh, at the point of death. Uh, what's known as information theory and theoretical physics clearly supports all of that. Um, world's smartest scientist, uh, a guy named Robert Lanza, uh, who uh, uh, studied the genetics of a chicken when he was 13 years old, um, uh, he uh, has uh, uh, come out uh, and said that he believes that consciousness is the substrate of the universe and material reality is based on that consciousness. But, you know, until we have some sort of scientific understanding that's accepted by the public, uh, we're never going to have uh, any acceptance of the evidence. And uh, that, uh, you know, we know that from the way science uh, progresses uh, in other fields. Uh, there's tons and tons of evidence. Your was real. You know, the idea that the continents have split apart from one giant, uh, you know, uh, initial supercontinent wasn't believed uh, until finally we understood what plate tectonics were all about. Um, one of my favorite ones uh, is the idea of washing uh, because uh, germs might cause infection. There was tons of evidence supporting that. Doctors well knew that they washed their hands. There would be less death uh, in uh, the patients that they would deliver, uh, you know, uh, babies, uh, you know, etc. And yet it was not accepted uh, by society until we could actually see those uh, germs under a microscope. So I applaud you for uh, assembling the evidence of these types of experiences. Uh, and yet uh, I'm now sharing with you why one of the uh, things that uh, AJ and I are, uh, you know, our, our team at the uh, Institute for the Scientific Consciousness is doing is we want to create a scientific framework so that scientists can now get on board with something that they all know is true. There, there is no physician listening to this who hasn't had some sort of experience uh, validating the concept of life after death, uh, and yet we as physicians don't want to talk about it uh, either. We don't want to sound crazy. I was unskilled, and you trained me. I was forgotten, and you reached out to me. I was fatherless, and you nurtured me. I was broken, and you mended me. 
As Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you do unto me. Support a child in his name through Compassion International at Compassion.com slash unto me. It's time to have your high five moment with High Five Casino, the top social casino where the action and real prizes never stop. Fun spins and big wins are right at your fingertips with over a thousand games, including High Five Casino exclusives. High Five Casino is always free to play with free coins given out every four hours. Sign up today and get free welcome coins you can spin for a chance at cash prizes. Visit HighFiveCasino.com. High Five Casino. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply. So you mentioned that uh, a boy drew some pictures for you. Did you ask all the children to draw pictures for you? Were they useful? Absolutely. Uh, we uh, learned more from drawing pictures or from the children's drawings than their uh, words. Uh, by and large, the children uh, would only have uh, small fragments of, uh, you know, of their experience. Uh, uh, they would say, uh, you know, these uh, very fragmented things like, uh, I think I shared with you earlier, I saw a crash cart. Uh, I heard all the nurses talking. Um, and, uh, you know, then I was back. Uh, they uh, sometimes uh, saw um, living teachers as part of their experience. Uh, sometimes they would see their classmates' uh, experience. But when they, we looked at their pictures, they had far uh, detail. Uh, one little girl who really told me, she just said, uh, well, of our 24 patients, six of them told us that they just saw a light, that that was what their dying experience was. I saw a light. Uh, one girl said, I saw a light and it had a lot of good things in it. <laughs> <laughs> that was her entire verbal experience. But then she drew me a picture of herself on her hospital gurney. She drew the picture uh, point of view of the ceiling. Uh, she looking down at herself. She currently drew that she did not have, uh, she did not have an IV. And that was correct. Uh, even though she came in seriously ill, we were unable to get an IV in her. We had to take her to the operating room uh, to put an IV in her. She correctly identified uh, the two doctors that are as being women. Uh, remember, our study was done 30 years ago uh, when uh, the women were the great minority uh, in uh, intensive care unit medicine. Uh, that's now. Uh, but uh, she, uh, she accurately got uh, those uh, details correct. Uh, she had them uh, wearing green masks on their face. When I looked at her picture, I thought to myself, why were the doctors wearing green masks? I thought to myself, wow, I finally found one that got a detail wrong. And uh, sure enough, uh, when I interviewed the doctors at the time, uh, they thought she might have had an infectious disease. Uh, she actually had uh, severe diabetes. Um, but um, uh, so they did wear green masks. Uh, I, I, one of the more uh, humorous uh, pictures that a little girl uh, drew me uh, you know, again, what she had to say about her experience, uh, she nearly died from uh, fulminant uh, meningitis. What she says was she saw a light that told her who she was and where she was to go. Was what she had to say about her experience. Uh, she also drew herself on the gurney. Uh, she drew my partner, uh, David Christopher. Uh, he was... Uh, she drew him with his hands perfectly positioned on her chest, his elbows perfectly flexed. I told him uh, that he gets an A for uh, cardiac resuscitation because she drew uh, such perfect details uh, of uh, his uh, stance and his technique while he was resuscitating her. She drew uh, a figure at the head of uh, her gurney, at the head of the bed, who was wearing a hat, and uh, that might seem odd to you, except uh, that at our hospital, because of the hubbub of resuscitation, there's so many people in the room, it's hard to identify the team leader. So the team leader always has to wear a hat 
and this little girl drew the team leader exactly right. So, you know, it's just, it's just extraordinary, all these details that they uh, get correct. Um, however, I do understand that it's for someone like myself who directly experienced it, it's very convincing. But I do also know that once these stories are heard second hand and third hand, you know, et cetera, uh, then I think, you know, people are rightfully skeptical of it. Uh, you know, they don't know me. They didn't personally witness this. And yet that's why I have a responsibility to share with what I actually saw. Because there'll, there'll never be another study like the Seattle study. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for coming on the podcast. We've just about run out of time. It's been really fascinating. Well, thank you for inviting us. We, it was thank a you pleasure. For, boy, I learned a lot just uh, listening to AJ talk. <laughs> We've we got to do this again, AJ. Of course we will. I, I do, uh, Simon, uh, before we go, um, uh, you know, I do have to share with you uh, that uh, because of uh, our work with uh, near-death experiences, you know, that we were able to show that people at the death, at the point of death, can see, basically, you know, spirits, for lack of a better word. Um, we tend to not call them spirits. We call them clusters of information uh, that exist uh, in the uh, all-information universe. Uh, but uh, that probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of your uh, listeners. Uh, so we were asked by the Bigelow uh uh, Institute for Consciousness Studies uh, to study mediumship. And, uh, you know, I know that that's, uh, well, at the time that we studied near-death experiences, that was very controversial. Uh, and we studied mediumship. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm proud that uh, uh, my mentor, uh, Raymond Moody, uh, he uh, has reviewed our research and told us uh, that he feels that we've taken the next step. That we have... Uh, you know, can, well, I don't think we've proven, but we've taken the first scientific step uh, to uh, document that mediumship is also real, just as real as the near-death experience. Um, so uh, I, I hope you're going to tell people about our website and people uh, can go to our website and learn more about that. Yeah, I'll put the link in the show notes and uh, perhaps we should book a date to record an episode so we can talk about that. Oh, I'd love to do that. That'd be great. Thank you. So this week I was talking to Dr. Melvin Morse and AJ Parr about children's near-death experiences. And a great way to support the podcast is to join Patreon. When you subscribe for $6 a month, you get exclusive access to an extended episode every week. And for $3 a month, you get access to an extended episode every month. And you can now sign up for a seven-day free trial. The Patreon episodes are ad-free and are released two days before the free versions. And please check out my other podcast, it's called the Alien UFO Podcast, and I release new episodes every Monday, and you can find that on almost every podcast app. And you can become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash our paranormal afterlife, or click on the Patreon button on my homepage at pastlifeshypnosis.co.uk. The links are in the show notes. And if you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review, and be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or via your favourite podcast app to make sure that you don't miss out on any episodes. And thanks for listening. forgotten and you reached out to me as jesus says whatever you do for the least of these you do unto me support a child in his name through compassion international at compassion.com slash unto me
It's time to have your high five moment with High Five Casino, the top social casino where the action and real prizes never stop. Fun spins and big wins are right at your fingertips with over a thousand games, including High Five Casino exclusives. High Five Casino is always free to play with free coins given out every four hours. Sign up today for a free welcome offer that can get you spinning and winning right away. Visit HighFiveCasino.com. High Five Casino. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply.